Here we go. First lecture of AP Bio, and we're going to start out with something easy, something that you're familiar with. We're going to look at different scientific investigations and make sure you know what we mean when we talk about the independent variable, dependent variable, and so on. You're going to find that the experiments you're going to analyze in AP Bio are going to be much more in-depth and way more complex than what you've seen in the past but you still should be able to figure out pretty easily what would be the IV, the DV, the constants, and so on. So let's review those. The independent variable in an investigation is the variable that's being changed or manipulated. I like to remember I for independent, I for what I changed when I set up the different parts of my experiment. For the dependent variable, I like to think of D for dependent, D for data. It's the data that you're going to collect to see if changing the IV is having an effect on the dependent variable. It is something that must be quantifiable. It must be measurable. It's going to be a number that you're going to write down in a table. If you write down 5 in a table at the end of the experiment, then that 5 is indicating or is an indication of the dependent variable. Constant means the same. We have to have other variables remaining constant or remaining the same throughout the duration of the experiment to make sure that we are going to get valid and accurate results. And then we also have an experiment, a part of the experiment that would be considered the control group. You're not going to have to define independent variable or dependent variable. I don't want you to have those definitions memorized. But I do want you to have this memorized. And I'll show you why here in a little bit. I've seen many questions where you're asked to indicate the control group and then indicate why the researcher established that control group. If you can state this, then you would definitely get your point. The control group is the part of the experiment that provides baseline data that we can use to compare to the other parts of the experiment to see if the changes that we made in the IV is having a significant effect on our data or on the dependent variable. Take a second to read through this experiment here and see if you can figure out quickly what's the IV, the DV, and what would be considered the control group. Remember the IV is what I change or the experimenter changes whenever they're setting up this experiment. And hopefully you're able to determine that the IV is the type of fluid that's being ingested by the rat. The DV is the data that we're collecting. So you can see here we have numbers, and these numbers are representing the dependent variable which is the average urine output. And then the control group is the part of the experiment that is the most normal setting. It's going to provide baseline data. Hopefully you were able to determine that water is considered the control group. It's going to give us data that we can use to compare to the other ones to see if these changes, like an increase in ethyl alcohol given, is having a significant effect on urine output. Now, half of your AP test is an essay score. So you're going to see lots of examples of essays related to experiments, and we're going to start conditioning you how to write your answers. And you have to forget what you've been taught in the past, maybe from your other AP classes about writing essays, because it's different for AP Bio. You need to note that your questions, your short essay questions, are going to be either worth three points or four points. And it's important that you quickly determine how to get those three or four points, and you address those questions very directly, and then move on to the next question, because you only have 90 minutes to answer eight essay questions. Let's take a look at what they're asking you to do here. This is obviously a three-point question, because they're asking you to pose a question, state a hypothesis, and describe an effect. Here's an example of a simple, to-the-point answer that would get you three points. For part A, and notice I indicate A here in my answer, I say a question being investigated is, and I state the question. You learned in the, in the past that a good format for a question is, how does the IV affect the DV? We want to indicate the IV here, which is alcohol consumption, or increase in alcohol percentage, affect urine output, which is DV. B says write a hypothesis. A hypothesis does not have to begin with if and then. It's just simply a prediction, but you need to make sure that you address how you're changing the IV and how it's affecting the DV. So again, you can see right here, an increase in alcohol consumption, so we're addressing the IV, is increasing urine output. 
So that's our DV. And then C states, using the data table, describe the effect of ethyl alcohol. So we're simply looking at the results and we're going to draw a conclusion. Again, we need to indicate how the IV is affecting or not affecting the DV. I already addressed some of these tips, but I want to go through some specifics about answering these AP questions. First, note the keywords. You can see that you had to pose, you had to state, and you had to describe. And that helps you identify how to get your points and the fact that there's three points on this question. And once you nail these three points, you need to move on to the next question. Notice in my answer, we have them sectioned off. If there's a question part A, you need to address that. B, indicate B, and C, indicate C, and so on. There's no intro statements. There's no fluff. We're simply looking for you to answer or do specifically what we ask. If the question says write a question, then you're going to start your response with a question is. I don't want you to write questions are very important to establish before starting an investigation. That's just extra fluff and it's not answering the question and you're wasting time by writing that. Also note that if you, in your essay answer, you just write information as bullets, you put a list, you draw a picture, that's going to be worth zero points. You must write complete statements. And as I indicated, for a hypothesis, you could ignore the if-then stuff that you've been taught in the past. All a hypothesis is is a prediction, and it indicates how you're changing the IV, and you're predicting what's going to happen to the DV. The next question that I included here just shows you the importance of having that de definition of what a control group provides memorized. Here they say, justify the researcher's decision to have a set of plants that are unsprayed. Most students can quickly determine that the unsprayed plants are considered the control group, and they'll state that in their answer. But if this is all that you say, then you're going to end up with just zero points. They want you to be able to explain the importance of a control group. So saying something like this, that the control group provides data used to compare to the sprayed plants, to determine if the sprays have an effect on seed development, that's the importance of a control group for this experiment. Again, it's not important that you can define independent variable or dependent variable, but make sure that you can explain the importance of having a control group in an experiment. The next two sample questions I'm providing is showing you that in some experiments, they're testing two independent variables at once. In the past, you may have been taught that you're not supposed to do that in an experiment, but it's completely acceptable, and you're going to see that when you have an experiment that has two or three or even four IVs being tested at once, it really just boils down to you comparing certain groups at a time and looking at the results, and that's going to help you be able to address a specific question. So let me give an example of some questions they might ask you. Here we have an experiment where they're changing different things to see the effect on photosynthetic rate. This question says, identify the groups to compare to determine if chloroplasts are necessary for photosynthesis. Notice in group one and group two, everything's the same. We're exposing to light and exposing to light, but they've boiled the chloroplast. So if you compare groups one and two, then you're going to see if chloroplasts are necessary for photosynthesis. This question states, what is the experimenter trying to determine by comparing the results of group one and group three? Again, notice that we have something constant. They're using healthy chloroplasts in both of these samples, but they're just changing light. So they're testing how does light affect photosynthetic rate. And I just reviewed how to write a question. How does the IV, so in this case, when you compare one and three, your IV is light. How does the IV affect the DV? So photosynthetic rate is the dependent variable. Here's another example where you have an experiment and they're testing multiple independent variables at one time. As a matter of fact, they're addressing four different IVs. When you glance at the beakers, Notice that some setups only have one difference. Like if we compare the setups between beakers one and beaker two, the temperature is the same, the addition of the water is the same, the addition of the mineral oil is the same, but you can see right here that what they are changing, the IV that they're testing, is how boiling radish seeds can affect their germination. So if that's a question that you're trying to determine, will boiling seeds affect germination, 
then the only beakers you need to compare are beakers 1 and 2. The experimenter also wanted to determine if changing temperature could affect the germination of the seeds. If you compare the results from beaker 1 and beaker 5, then you can answer that question. Again, notice there's only one difference between those two columns, and that is the temperature here, whereas everything else is the same for these columns. So you're going to get valid results if you compare the results from beaker 1 and beaker 2. If you want to see how the addition of the deoxygenated water is affecting germination, then you would want to compare beakers 3 and 4 because that's what they're changing, or that's the IV that's being tested between those two beakers. Note that you would never compare, let's say, beakers 2 and 5. Analyzing beakers 2 and 5, you can see that they're changing temperature, but then they're also changing the boiling of the seeds. And when we analyze these results, if we see a difference in germination of the seeds, we will not be able to determine whether it's because they used a colder or warmer temperature or if they were boiling the seeds or not. And you can only compare two beakers that only have one difference between them. Next, we're going to talk about graphing. And the good news is, is that everything you need to know to graph well on the AP exam, you've already been taught. So let's review some of the basics. Graphing is usually a three-point question. You're going to get one point for appropriately labeling the axis. Remember that the DV is always going to go on the y-axis, whereas your IV is either going to go on the x-axis or it's going to be in the key. To refresh, remember this up and down part of the graph is going to be the y. I like to think of it as the tail of a y. And then the horizontal part is the x-axis. One key to labeling your axis is to make sure that you use the exact text that's given to you in the table that contains the data you're expected to graph. Even if you don't understand the units or the headings, you still want to use that exact text and put it either on the x or the y axis or possibly in the key. Another point comes from correctly plotting your data points on the correct type of graph. Now sometimes you're told, and you're going to see some examples where it says make a line graph or make a bar graph but sometimes you're going to have to decide which type of graph to make. Here are some guidelines to use if you're trying to determine whether to make a line or a bar graph. When looking at your x-axis and what's labeled there, if those categories on the x-axis must stay in order for it to make sense, then it's more appropriate to make a line graph. If the categories on the x-axis can be switched in any order and the graph and the data still makes sense, then it's more appropriate to make a bar graph. The third point is going to come from using the correct scale or intervals on your axis, and we're going to talk about that with this next example. Here's an example of an AP item where you're given a table and data and you're asked to graph it. We can tell that this is the independent variable, this is what's being changed, this is the data we're collecting, so this is going to be the dependent variable. One point is going to come from appropriately labeling our axis. Remember that the dependent variable is going to go on the y-axis, and we're going to write it exactly as it shows in the table. Even if you do not understand these terms, we're going to write it exactly as is. Don't forget to include the units given to you in the table. Since this is a simple graph, a simple line graph, temperature is going to go on the x-axis. Again, we need to indicate the units. The second point is going to come from plotting our data correctly and making the appropriate graph. In this case, it's more appropriate to make a line graph than a bar graph. And I'll explain that after I put the numbers or the intervals on the x-axis. The third point comes from labeling our axis with numbers using correct intervals or correct spacing. Next, I'm going to show you what not to do. So don't write this down, but I'll correct it eventually. A common mistake I see students make is they will start with the first temperature. Let's indicate it's 20. And then they'll space over. And let's say in this case, they space over 3. So 21, 22, and then we put 23 right here. And then we'll space over 3 more. And they'll write the next number, which is 27, according to the table and then they'll space over three more, and they'll put 28. These numbers are not evenly spaced. This has a difference of three, 
this one has a difference of 4, this one has a difference of 1. So since they're not evenly spaced numbers, we should not evenly space them on the x-axis. Here's the correct way to space these numbers. Again, we're going to start with 20, and we can start it in, or we can start at the beginning. I'm going to start at the beginning. I like to put lines to make sure I keep my spacing accurate. So we have 20 degrees, and we either put 20 degrees Celsius here, or we can just indicate with our units degrees Celsius here. And I'm going to indicate other temperatures, even though we didn't specifically test them, just to make sure that I leave space for them. So this would be 21. This is going to be 22 degrees Celsius, 23, 24 degrees Celsius, 25, 26 degrees Celsius, 27, and then finally 28 here. For my intervals on the y-axis, I have to plot from 1.5 to 4.5. So I could probably indicate 1 would be here, and then 4 more is going to give me 2, another 4 is going to give me 3, another 4 is going to give me 4, and then this is going to be 5. If I start off indicating that 4 boxes equals 1, then my next 4 boxes also have to equal 1. I cannot alter this value as I move up this type of graph. I've indicated my four data points, 1.5, 3, 5, and 4.5. Notice that even though I don't have 27 labeled here, I still have a data point for it in the correct location. Let's talk about drawing lines. I recommend that students connect the dots and make sure they draw straight lines between two data points. This box indicates some common mistakes that I see students make. I'll talk more about the first one on the next page. Let's talk about the second one. Do not draw your line past the first and last data point. You're going to lose a point if you draw past that last data point. And as I indicated before, do not evenly space your numbers that are unevenly spaced. Again, these numbers were unevenly spaced. This had a difference of 3, this one has a difference of 4, and this one has a difference of 1, so these numbers should not be spaced evenly on the x-axis. On the previous page, I chose to make a line graph, and I'm going to just re-emphasize why I chose to do that and show you a few more examples here. It's more appropriate to make a line graph when the categories on the x-axis must go in order. Let's analyze some of these graphs here. You can see on the x-axis we have 2, 4, 6. Would it make sense if I put the 6 here and move the 4 over here? Obviously, that wouldn't make sense. Since these numbers must go in a certain order, it's more appropriate to make a line graph. Same here, we can look at the categories or the, what we're putting on the x-axis. It wouldn't make sense to go 40, 20, and 60. So therefore, it's more appropriate to use a line graph than a bar graph. Remember, in a single line graph, the IV is on the x-axis. If you have to make a multi-line graph or analyze a multi-line graph, this is what they're testing. They are changing the color of the light. The IV is in the key. It's more appropriate to make a bar graph when the categories on the x-axis can be switched or arranged in any order, and it's still going to make sense. If I was graphing this information, I could have listed honeybees first and mosquitoes second. It wouldn't change my results and I would still be able to draw conclusions from the graph. Over here, for this graph, I could have listed nitrogen first and phosphorus second, or I could have put this one first. It doesn't matter the order of the categories on the x-axis, so it's more appropriate to report a result as a bar graph. Remember, in a single bar graph, the IV is going to be on the x-axis. So in this case, we're comparing the different types of insects. When you have a double bar graph, you can see for phosphorus, I have two bars there then the IV is in the key. We are looking at these levels of phosphorus and nitrogen between species A and species B. Before we move on from graphs, I want to show you three graphs that would lose points. The first one, it's a little bit hard to tell, but you can see how when the student is connecting the dots, they put a slope there. Again, we want to make a straight line 
between each data point. Also, we want to make sure that we do not go past a data point. And in addition, I wanted to talk about this. If the table doesn't tell you that it's zero, there was zero, then do not automatically connect back to zero, zero. Only put a data point on zero, zero and connect to it if the table says at zero, it's zero. I think you can look at the other graphs and understand why they would be missing points here. Again, we should have just been drawing our line connecting the dots like this. Again, with this graph, we shouldn't have gone past the first data point. And again, connect the dots with a straight line. Here's your first look at a 10 point essay question. You can see there's a lot to it. There's data given, it's about an experiment, and there's several parts to the question. Take a second to hit pause, read through the question, and all we're gonna focus on now is just this part A, constructing a graph. See if you can figure out what you're gonna put on your X and your Y axis. Before I move down to the graph, let's just analyze this table here and see if you can figure out what the independent variable is. We have a group, that is the control group, and then we have a group that is being exposed to caffeine. This is our independent variable. Notice for this 10 minute mark, we're gonna have two data points. So that means we're gonna have either like a double line or a double bar graph that we're making, and same for 24 hours here. And this is gonna be our dependent variable, which is gonna be written on the Y axis. Remember I said that when you have a double bar, double line graph, the IV, which you don't have to label IV, but the IV is going to be in the key. You're going to have bars for the control, and you're going to have bars for the caffeine group. To me, the easiest part is figuring out what goes on the y-axis. We're going to write this exactly as is. Even this part in the parentheses is going to end up going down here on this y-axis. And then what's left? Well, we have the treatment labeled. We have the DB labeled memory. And so what's left is minutes. So we would end up putting 10 minutes here. And then I believe it's 24 hours here and then we're gonna end up graphing and have two bars. So now I'm going to just make up data quickly and just draw some bars here to save time. But we're gonna have for 10 minutes, remember we have a bar, and that would be for the control. That's what our key is gonna show us, is the control is gonna have a certain symbol. And then we're gonna have a bar for caffeine. We wanna make it the same size. So just to the right data point. And then for 24 hours, again, we're gonna have a bar for the control, and then we'll have a bar for caffeine. Next, I want to discuss the questions in which you're gonna to have to design or describe your own experiment. You can see down here in this example question, part C says, design a controlled experiment to determine this is how you're going to get your results on those types of questions. Note that for part C, or pretty much any time where you're asked to design an experiment, there's going to be a maximum score you can get from that section of the question. In this case, it's going to be a max of four points. Here's how you could get points. If you identify the independent variable, specifically what you're going to set up and change, that would get you one point. If you identify specifically the dependent variable, tell me what it is I'm going to measure. You're not going to get points if you say something like observe the results. If you can list three constants, that can get you a point, but you must list three. If you identify the control group for the experiment, if you indicate that you should have a large sample size or that you can repeat the experiment to collect more data samples and to verify your results, then that can give you a point for verification and replication. And if you give a hypothesis or a prediction about what you think is going to happen to the dependent variable as you change the independent variable, then that's gonna be worth another point. It's important to note though, let's say you're writing a description of your experiment and you indicate the independent variable, the dependent variable, 
you list three variables to keep constant, and you identify the control group. You need to stop writing on that portion of the question, even though you didn't talk about verification or you didn't identify a hypothesis, and move on to the next question because you only have about 90 minutes to answer the essay questions on the test. So as soon as you reach your max, you need to move on. I would like for you to hit pause and read through this released question, focusing more on part C where we're designing a controlled experiment. And then notice I've given you a scoring rubric. When a grader scores your essays, there's going to be a rubric that's going to identify how they can give you points. And here's the rubric used for this type of question. It's going to look very similar to the list that I just showed you at the top of the page. But look through here and indicate what you would have to say to get your points on that section of the question. Now that you're familiar with the scoring rubric, I want you to look on the next page and you're going to find an example response from a student. Read through the student response and see how you would score them. And then I'm going to take a second to go through and explain how many points I would have scored according to the rubric. The student says, to create such an experiment, one needs to separate areas, both with the same type of flora, except one's going to tame herbivores, and the other one is going to allow it to grow on its own. What the student is describing is to take an area and separate it, put herbivores on this side, and no herbivores on this side. Now, this indication is going to give the student one point for establishing an IV. As for the DV, the student gets close and attempts to say, compare the type of diversification that has occurred afterwards. But specifically, I'm still left with the question, what am I supposed to count and measure for those two different areas of land? So zero points for a dependent variable. The student indicates that you must ensure that both regions have equal access to pollinators. So notice there's one, two, three constants listed. So that would give the student another point. And that's it for this essay question. Out of four points, the student has earned two. Let's take a second to go back to the scoring rubric and see what else they could have suggested to gain more points in that section. They didn't indicate what part of the experiment was to control. Now they established it. They set it up. They put one area where there's no herbivores, but they needed to say that this would be considered the control. Even though the student said for verification and replication, just let the two areas sit for some time. So they're indicating that you should take a while to collect data, but they don't necessarily say that, so I can't give them a point for verification and replication. And also, they didn't give any prediction or hypothesis. Hopefully you have a good idea of what you have to indicate to get maximum points for designing an experiment. But let me show you how this is somewhat altered whenever you get directions that go like this. Here we have another experiment and it says design an experiment using artificial flowers. And then it says very specifically, identify the null hypothesis. So there's one thing they want you to do. Identify a control treatment. So that's the second thing you need to do and then predict the results. Now, those three items would have gotten you points on the previous essay question we looked at, but notice it didn't say anything about identify the independent variable or identify the dependent variable. If you would have discussed how to set up the IV and a DV and so on, indicated three constants maybe, that's going to be a waste of your time on this question. You would have gotten zero points for those indications. So the lesson that we learned is, if they say design an experiment, and then they give you specifically different aspects to talk about, like the null hypothesis, the control treatment, and predict the results, make sure you do those things to get the maximum on that part experiment, which would have been three in this case. The last example I want to show you is that sometimes you don't have to understand science content to answer an essay question. This is an example where they're giving you results, and you have to be able to look at the data and then draw some conclusions. Again, I want to note that whenever I'm answering this question, there's two parts to the question. So when I write my response, I'm going to indicate my answer in two sections, A and B.
Also note that I get right to the point and I'm answering the question in a complete sentence. A says, identify the following, the antibiotic that was most likely to be effective. So I start my answer with, the antibiotic most effective is, and then again, the antibiotic that was least effective, because I was asked to identify that, so I state that and I get right to the point and answer the question. For part B, it's not about knowing science content or ideas about science, it's about being able to look at data and provide an answer. It says using the data provide justification for the claim that antibiotic resistance may arise in bacteria species. Here I have a sample answer in which I'm using the data from the graph to verify that resistance can increase or arise over time in bacterial populations.